President Biden Wednesday told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he expected a, quote, significant de-escalation of the conflict in the Middle East by the end of Wednesday. That's according to a White House readout of the call between the two world leaders. But in a statement, Netanyahu said his country would continue its strikes on Gaza, and Israel's top diplomat in the U.S. said the country was not looking for a ceasefire. CBS News foreign correspondent Intiaz Tayeb has the latest from Tel Aviv. If a ceasefire is near, it doesn't feel like it. Air sirens sent dozens of Israelis and our crew into this southern Israeli bomb shelter. Several Hamas rockets were intercepted right above us. In Gaza, Israel's bombing campaign has been unrelenting. Despite President Biden's call to de-escalate today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed the operation will continue, tweeting, until its goal is achieved to restore peace and security to you, the citizens of Israel. Since fighting began 10 days ago, more than 50,000 Palestinians have been displaced, and these United Nations schools are the only refuge. And it's been the youngest who suffer the worst, like Nadine Abdul Taif. I'm only 10. Seen in multiple social media posts, she's become the face of Gaza's children. I want to feel safe for like one day at least. I never feel safe in my own home. It's a feeling shared across the border by 10-year-old Israeli Renana Botzer Switza. What's it like in your house? It's very scary. I need all the time to be prepared to run to my room that is the safe room in my house. Renana lives just a few miles away from Gaza and fled with her parents to this temporary housing. When we asked her what she'd say to Nadine if they were to ever meet... I wasn't saying nothing. I just was, I just hugged her. The Israeli media is reporting that a ceasefire could come as early as Friday. But the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. has told CBS News that they're looking for a, quote, cure and not a Band-Aid. Lana. Hmm. MTS, thank you. We have been exploring this conflict from multiple angles, and joining me today is Rashid Khalidi. He is a professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University. Professor Khalidi, thank you so much for joining us to share your perspective. I'd like to start off with the latest news. Hamas laid out its conditions for a ceasefire with Israel on Wednesday. Their two conditions are that Israeli forces and police agree to not enter the al Aska mosque again, and that Palestinians living in a disputed neighborhood in East Jerusalem not be evicted. Tell us about those conditions, and do you think that these are realistic preconditions to a ceasefire? Well, I think what they point to is what really started this, which is this ongoing process of eviction and dispossession of Palestinians from properties like the one in Sheikh Jarrah, and a series of encroachments on the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and on the Haram Sharif around it that have been going on for a very long— both things have been going on for a very long time. But these are really the things that triggered this whole uh, uh, outbreak of violence. And uh, I, I don't know whether they're realistic. Uh, in a normal world, not entering the third holiest mosque in Islam with soldiers firing tear gas grenades should be a simple ask. Uh, preventing people from attacking worshipers during the Ramadan prayers should not be a controversial request. Um, preventing people from being evicted from the homes that they've lived in for 60 years should not be even controversial. Will Israel do these things? Well, that's up, up to the Israeli government, obviously. The White House says President Biden spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday, and according to a readout of their call, the president told uh, the prime minister that he, quote, expected a significant de-escalation today on the path to a ceasefire. What do you see as the U.S. role in trying to bring an end to this conflict, and is it working? Uh, what I expect is one thing, and what we're likely to get is another thing. I mean, what I would expect is that the major a supplier of weapons to the Israeli army, insisting that those weapons are used for defensive purposes. The killing of over 200 people, most of them civilians in Gaza, doesn't look defensive to most of the world. Uh, what I think uh, this administration has done is completely inadequate. Uh, the bloodshed that has taken place, almost all of it on the, on the Palestinian side, there have been 10 Israeli civilians killed, but there have been over 212 in Gaza, and there have been a couple of dozen in the occupied Palestinian territories should have led the United States to insist 
that Israel stopped long ago. Um, the latest report I heard from AP is that the Israeli prime minister is stonewalled. For some reason, he wants to continue with this pointless offensive that's just killing more people and, frankly, alienating more people uh, from uh, Israel. I want to follow up with you on that point in just a moment, but um, but first, you've actually written at length about U.S. involvement, and you've argued that it's actually undermined the peace process between Israel and Palestine. I'm wondering if you can take a moment first to walk us through that, and, and if you feel that the U.S. cannot play the role of peacemaker, who might be better able? Well, I, I have argued at length that the approach that the United States takes is not just one where it's not an honest broker, but rather is, as Aaron David Miller himself, one of the American senior American diplomats involved, called uh, acting as Israel's lawyer. Uh, the last thing Israel needs is a lawyer. And the last thing it needs is the greatest superpower on earth to be putting its big thumb on the scale on the already imbalanced Israeli side of that scale. Um, the United States, I think, has utterly failed to advance peace in the Middle East. You will remember that the so-called peace process was supposed, as far as Palestine is concerned, was supposed to have started with the Camp David summit back in 1978. We have not had peace in Palestine uh, since 1978, since the Oslo process began. And a large share of this, I think, falls on the United States. The United States starts from the wrong place. It talks about Israeli security. It doesn't talk about Palestinian security. The most insecure people in Palestine and Israel are not the Israelis, however insecure many of them undoubtedly feel. They are the Palestinians. Uh, and one could go through American positions one by one and see uh, a, a failure to deal with the basic substantive issues. Um, the evictions, the planned evictions in Sheikh Jarrah, the attacks on the Al-Aqsa Mosque are just uh, uh, symbols of the kinds of problems that the United States has refused to deal with. The people about to be evicted were refugees. The United States deferred discussion of refugees from, for decades in negotiations. Uh, whether at Camp David in 1978, whether in the, the talks I was a participant in in Washington in the early 1990s, or whether after uh, the uh, Oslo Accords. So the United States failing to grasp the nettle of issues like Jerusalem, of issues like refugees, which are the core issues in this conflict, as this bloodshed has shown, are just examples of how the United States has actually failed to do anything to bring lasting, sustainable peace uh, to Palestine and Israel. Uh, and as you point out, the history of uh, failed peace processes um, are, are decades mm -hmm. in the making. Uh, but right. there was another part of that question that I, I want to circle back to, which is, is, if not the U.S., then who might be able to help broker peace in the Middle East? Well, I have two answers to that question. The first is, the United States is uh, maybe uh, a pivoting away from the Middle East, maybe diminishing its its uh, footprint in the Middle East, but it is still the 900-pound gorilla there. Uh, you can't get the Middle East out of this process. If you, if the United States would efface itself a little bit, I would say almost any other major actor uh, would be a better intermediary with Israel uh, than the United States would be. The United States, at every stage of this, has been guided by advice which says you have to coddle the Israelis. You have to make them feel secure or they won't make concessions. Well, the Israelis have never made concessions as far as Palestine is concerned. I mean real substantive concessions. Um, and the United States has coddled them and coddled them and coddled them. Uh, I would argue that almost any other intermediary would be doing a better job as, as, a, as an honest broker uh, than would the United States. Now, where that intermediary is to be found, I don't know. Uh, would the Europeans do it? I don't think they can. They're not united. Uh, uh, could you count on the United Nations? Well, the United Nations, as we've seen, can be stymied, as it has been several times in the past 10 days, by the United States simply uh, putting its foot down and preventing uh, action from taking place in the Security Council. So uh, we do need uh, a, f a format, a forum, which is more balanced and, and fairer than one where the United States dominates the proceedings entirely. Uh, and I think it's, it's up to uh, perhaps the president and others to think about where that forum could be, what, what the structure, what the architecture of a better process than any that the United States has been involved in as, Palestine, as far as Palestine is concer concerned for decades and decades and decades. And Professor Khalidi, as you mentioned earlier, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, 
didn't seem to fully embrace uh, the comments from President Biden. He thanked him in a statement for his support. But he said he's, quote, determined to continue this operation until its objective is achieved to restore quiet and security to you, citizens of Israel. As we are talking about the prospect for peace, how much damage do you think that this conflict causes to Jewish-Arab relations and further entrenches these sides and, and makes the possibility for peace even more elusive? Well, I think that the prospects of—when you talk about Jewish-Arab relations, I assume you're talking about the situation among citizens of Israel. Arab citizens and, and Jewish citizens, but I think if, if you if you pull out a little bit um, and examine the extent to which what has happened in the last several weeks, starting in Jerusalem and then continuing with the bombardment of Gaza, has uh, uh, affected people uh, all over the Palestinian diaspora uh, in all parts of Palestine. Palestinians have been unified by what has happened in the last several weeks in a way we haven't seen for many many years. But Arab sentiment and sentiment in the Islamic world has shifted very strongly in favor of the Palestinians. Now, um, whether that improves or, or, or hinders uh, the search for peace is another question. But I think we have to look at that in terms of a, a complete failure on the part of Israel to understand that sending soldiers to fire tear gas and stun grenades into the third holiest mosque in Islam is guaranteed to ruin uh, relations between Israel and many, many countries, and Israel's image the world over. Um, and all the countries that began a normalization process with Israel, in view of how their public opinion has reacted to this, are having serious second thoughts uh, about that today. And I think that as far as relations between uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and Jewish citizens of Israel uh, are concerned, the degree to which mob violence, mainly from the uh, side of extremists, religious fanatics directed against Arab communities has damaged coexistence is something a little hard to, to, to measure at this stage. Uh, but I think it's a result of a rightward trend and an anti-Palestinian hatred that has grown on the Israeli side, and at the same time, intense frustration uh, by Palestinian citizens of Israel with their appalling second-class status. Uh, I, I don't think that that situation can continue unless Israel begins to understand that you can push people just so far without a reaction, uh, I'm afraid we may see a, a further deterioration, not just uh, within Israel, among citizens of the state of Israel, but in the occupied territories and in the region uh, as a whole. Professor Rashid Khalidi, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me.